What's up? This is Adam and Steve. Not Adam and Eve from the band Caven. And you're watching Premier Guitar with the Big Five. My favorite guitar would probably be my uh, Gibson SG that I got when I was in high school. I got this for $400 out of the want ads. I met a gentleman in the 99 restaurant parking lot and gave him $400 cash. Um, this is before the internet and you know the, before the days of just driving your mom's car to meet a stranger in the 99 restaurant parking lot. I had this, um, it was my first kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm getting a real guitar to be in a real band. So this, is, this was it. I knew I was in once I got this. I played it for about 20 years in Caven. It was in our band fire. If you look close, you can see that it was on fire at a certain time. That's all black from being on fire. I saw it being pulled out of our van while it was engulfed in flames and it was shot with a fire hose. I saw this thing get shot with a fire hose once. <laughs> um, Meridian guitar brought it back to life. Meridian, rest in peace. Um, but I love, this is my favorite guitar. My, you know, if I had to go back into a, my house that's on fire, this is the one that I'm gonna grab first. It's very sentimental to me. Um, the finish has been sweated off. There's so much history of Caven in this guitar, history of my music career, my life in music, uh, my life in this town, Methuen, Massachusetts, growing up and leaving Methuen, it's all on this guitar. You got that thing rigged with some, an EMG as I well. I did, uh, this EMG. Juicy. Right? EMG because I love Metallica back in the day. Jay Pachette, the original singer of Caven, actually installed it with this, ja this is from a Jackson right here, which shouldn't be on a Gibson. Um, because we didn't know what we were doing, and he drilled the hole in my brand, in my SG in high school to put this EMG in here. I believe that this is an early 80s, it says the SG on there, the SG, which I know they have the Paul and the SG, I, I forget what they call them, um, oh god, Firebrand, does that make sense? Firebrand? Well, it would certainly make sense yeah, considering the situation. <laughs> but apparently like the SG and the Paul were these models they made where they're all kind of these wood grain like this in the early 80s, so I believe that's what this was. And it actually had a T pickup, like a, a black and white kind of pickup, which I wish was still in there, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I was a townie metal kid, they wanted to put an EMG in it. But it had a T <laughs> pickup that it looked really good when I first got it. It did. This pickup right here is a wooden pick guard, which is kind of like, that's definitely a custom job by the gentleman that I bought it from. I've never seen another SG with a wooden pick guard like that. It's also been broken in half. Um, you can see the neck job. You can't really see because it's points here, but again, Meridian, Steve was actually playing at the Cave and Show and I threw him off the stage and he <laughs> fell on top of it. And I remember, I remember what once he, I remember throwing him off the stage. It was like, you know, stupid kid stuff. And he threw piece by piece on stage first and then he got back up. It was like headstock, body. I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> favorite guitar is this 93 Gibson Les Paul Studio and this is a family heirloom this once belonged to my dad and I remember going to daddy's junkie music with him uh, when this thing was brand new I was first learning how to play guitar wrapping my head around it my dad actually played guitar in bands when he was a kid and uh, he just always wanted a Les Paul, and so that was the time to buy it because I was just getting into playing guitar. And so we went to Daddy's Junkie Music in Salem, New Hampshire, and we picked this thing out. And I believe the asking price was somewhere close to 700 and he got him down to 550 and I was like, oh man, my dad's a, he's a badass. He just, <laughs> he just knocked the price down by almost 200 bucks on this thing. Pretty cool. And then it was in the family for several years until um, one Christmas morning, um, you know, I was still in high school, went downstairs and underneath the tree was the case with this guitar in it and a little bow. And I was like, oh damn, what do you know? This thing is mine now. <laughs> and so this has been on numerous old school cave and recordings. Um, it did suffer a pretty gnarly break on the headstock. You might be able to see it. A good friend, Jay Canava, glued this thing back to life, plays better than ever, and um, recently I busted it out for the uh, Cave and Until Your Heart Stops shows that we did, um, the Decibel Festival, and 
playing some of that material leading up to the Decibel Fest um, late last year. Uh, I don't like to really bring it on the road for obvious reasons. I like to keep it safe as you know, safe at home at this point. But uh, yeah, it seemed like the right thing to do for those shows, and that's right. This is my this is my baby. No real modifications. Um, actually, maybe the tuners are new. Um, yeah, I can actually see where the old tuners would have been. Other than that, I think it might be all the original pieces. I mean, maybe a new bridge, but it's kind of hard to tell. What is my Desert Island album? Uh, I'm gonna be a smart ass and say The Jesus Lizard because if I was stuck on a fucking desert island, I figured if I listened to The Jesus Lizard enough, I could actually run on water like a Jesus Lizard and get my ass off of a desert island. <laughs> that was fucking stupid. <laughs> I have to go with Led Zeppelin Physical Graffiti. It's kind of the, the opus of Zeppelin in terms of everything that's in their arsenal. Um, they got it all. And uh, it's a double LP, because I have a lot of fucking nothing to do on a desert island. I'm racking my brain, it changes year to year of like what record I would like can't live without. Um, if I had to pick one this year, it'd, uh, I'd be Death for the World to See, Death from Detroit. However, if I'm going to go Steve's Row and pick a long, long record because I'm on a desert island, I would pick Rolling Stone's Exile on Main Street, because again, it has everything they do. And it's like two hours long. And I can get rock and roll, uh, bar, barroom, brawling rock and roll, country songs, ballads, uh, gospel and blues. It's all there. What's my gu biggest guitar culture pet peeve? Um, just the, I, I guess my, I mean, it doesn't even fall on guitar, but just like the, the idea that you need crazy fancy gear and guitars and fancy boutique pedals to sound good and write good songs where you don't really need any of that. For me, it would be... Um... I don't see this happening as much these days, thanks to the internet and YouTube and, you know, cover versions of songs being more common than it was when I was growing up. But um, I think the aversion to learning other people's songs is always weird to me. I mean, Jimi Hendrix was famously known for covering Sgt. Pepper like three days after it came out. He did it live at some show somewhere. You know, apparently Paul McCartney was in the audience or something. It's like it's just some crazy story. But um, that really is the key to elevating your craft, uh, whether it's your playing or your songwriting, um, just your appreciation for life, just getting other people's musical DNA into your own. Um, it really is the best way to just ascend to new levels of creativity. Don't be afraid to learn other people's shit. It's good for you. A secret guitar hero of mine would probably be Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, I'm surprised about that one myself. Hey, see? <laughs> Got him. <laughs> um, yeah, at a pretty formative age playing music, um, there was a copy of The Sky is Crying kicking around the house, and um, I loved it. I would just crank that shit up to where the speakers were breaking and um, I love how much space that he was able to fill as a single guitar player um, and that dude is so smooth I mean it's so rare that he fucks up I don't think I've ever heard him fuck up it's pretty wild there's a great video that you can find where uh, he's on some late night show and he breaks the string in the middle of a performance and his tech comes running out switches the guitar and the whole thing is done so seamlessly, you're just like, this dude is a badass. Uh, I'm going to go with John Frusciante. I can't say that I'm a huge Chili Peppers fan, but I'm a huge John Frusciante fan. I heard his guitar playing early on as a kid. Obviously, Under the Bridge was on every radio, every, every radio station growing up in Methuen. And I just love the, um, like that post-Hendrix guitar style. Um, it's just, I've always been attracted to it. Um, years ago, my friend Caleb sent me... Um, 
the Blood Sugar Sex Magic guitar and bass only, and it's like a prog record. It's so good. It's so fun to listen to. And um, I just think his solos are great. I, I, I think he does so much with the, his style. The simplicity of his solos and the melody of them all, I just get... I always have an ear for it. Even the new, the, the new song that just came out, I was like, well, I want to hear the new song to see what the solo is, and it's a ripping solo. I don't think there's a lot of guitar guys left in modern music doing that stuff, so it's just good to hear, A, for Shante back in the band and just doing Guitar God stuff still. And, um, you know, I love all the solo records. There's stuff on there that sounds like Funkadelic or uh, Eddie Hazel. Um, I think he's really well-rounded. It's almost like a you know, punk rock Eddie Hazel, punk rock Jimi Hendrix um and Minutemen is mixed in there and almost like Frank Zappa too I, I just think he has a really cool west coast vibe that is his own and it's very inspiring to me what is my secret weapon I don't know if it's much of a secret anymore but Caven is known for using the boss PS3 pitch shifter they don't make these anymore boss what is your fucking problem this pedal was a great discovery um I think it came at a time when the band was um sort of looking to reinvent itself anyways, right around the time of like Creative Eclipses and Jupiter. And this pedal just kind of did something that, it basically extracted a sound that I've heard in my head for a long time. Um, so thank you, PS3. As far as Caven's use of the PS3, um, we use it like hit sauce. Basically like, okay, here's the chorus. <laughs> Boom, <laughs> there it is. Now that shit is singing and there's like, several octaves sort of swirling around your head. It's like a sonic bubble bath. It's like a sparkling melody. Wicked spot. <laughs> my secret weapon, uh, you know, I, it's funny, I'm sick of my secret weapon because I've used it for so, so many years at this point. However, Adam McGrath's secret weapon is a MXR phaser set to zero with a tremolo afterwards. So your tremolo goes it always sounds like something's moving because it's a slow, slow wave happening at all times. I'm a big reggae fan. I picked that up from Lee Scratch Perry. Lee Scratch Perry puts a slow phase on all his drums. He puts it on vocals sometimes. He puts it on a guitar. And it's just a really interesting effect to make it sound like there's a lot, there's movement happening, but it's happening very slow. No. 